You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 93. Welcome back, Curd Nerds. I'm Gavin Webber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheesemaking at home. Today's special guest is Jennifer Murch, who has a YouTube channel of that name and also a uh, a, a blog. She blogs. Still going. Um, so uh, you can go to jennifermurch.com or you can go to YouTube and search for Jennifer Murch. Uh, Jennifer is a homesteader and she has two dairy cows herself, so she has lots of milk. So with that lots of milk, she has to make lots of cheese. So sit back, relax, grab a cuppa and a piece of your favourite cheese and crackers and let's listen and watch the interview between myself and Jennifer Merch. We have Jennifer waiting, Jennifer Merch waiting in the background. Uh, let me just bring her in. Let's see if this works. Oh, there she is, little, but we'll make her bigger. There she is. And can I hear you? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, <laughs> it all works. Goodness me. <laughs> good. So good. Right, <laughs> Jennifer. Good. Jennifer is from Virginia, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. There you go. I got that right too, see. Mm -hmm. I had to dig through your blog to find that out. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> so Jennifer has a blog called Jennifer Merch. Also has a YouTube, I think, of the same name. Is that correct? Uh, yes. YouTube Jennifer Merch, blog Jennifer Merch. Yep, lovely. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're a bit of a homesteader type thing. And, uh, yeah, you've got your own cow and make lots of cheese, amongst many, many other things. <laughs> Right, so can you, uh, no, we won't introduce you, we just did that. All right, um, so why, Jennifer, did you start making cheese? Well, we started, I tried cheese a number of years back when we were getting raw milk from a local farm, but it was expensive and mm. I was making small wheels and the learning curve was so steep and I had four little kids and it didn't work. It, was, it wasn't worth it. Mm. And then this past um, 2018, we got four bottle-fed calves from a local dairy, and we were going to raise them for slaughter. And three of them were steers, and one was a heifer. And that was in 2018. When it came time for them to be slaughtered, the heifer, I was thinking, well, why don't we just breed her and try a dairy cow, which I've always wanted to do. Yeah. And we were in the middle of the pandemic, so we weren't going anywhere. And my younger son, Nicholas, he is, he was 14 or 15 at the time. And he said, I'll milk. And you have to understand, Gavin, that neither my husband nor I are farmers. We don't, we don't do that. And my husband hates it. And so when my son said he would, he would milk, we were like tentatively agreeable. So we bred Daisy, she gave birth and Nicholas hand milked her for the first, I don't know, couple months, couple weeks, whatever. And then he switched to an electric milker. Six yep. months into that, then he um, stopped and and my husband took over because he kind of jumped on board. But yeah. since that, I've been into cheese making. That's what got it started because if you have all that milk, you have to use it. Got to do something with it, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. So your cow's name's Daisy. Is that the, the original cow or you got another one? That's Daisy. Daisy is a whole scene and we're actually trying to sell her, but nobody wants her. So I don't know what's going to happen. And my husband can't, this is funny. My husband can't part with her because he's actually attached to her. She's kind of his little pet. Friends. So we're yeah. laughing about that. Um, but then a few months ago, we got Emma, who is a Jersey and she was pregnant. She gave birth. And so now my husband is milking two cows. Oh, goodness. So, <laughs> so it's a lot of milk, but um, yeah. So we have Jersey and Holstein milk. Yeah, so how do you compare the two milks, as in the the richness of the milk and the the milk fat difference? It, it really, I mean, I think I'm probably biased towards Jersey milk just because of what everybody says, but the Holstein milk actually, okay, there's so many factors, but Daisy, the Holstein, is 
she is no longer doesn't have a calf nursing on her. So we're getting all her milk, just one once a day milking. And her yeah. cream level on the top is a good of a gallon is a good two, three cups, but it's thinner. It, it doesn't quite um, get the, the thick cap on it that yeah. Emma's milk, who she is still nursing, we're calf sharing. So we only get a less amount of milk, but it's 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 really rich. It's like sour cream. It's yeah. really thick. Yeah. yeah. So you leave it for a few days and you've got like a big plug in the top of your milk. Oh, bottle. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, you can you yeah. could you could pre- I mean basically it's like clotted clotted cream, but not soured at all. Not yeah, 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 indeed. Uh, I suppose with all that milk. So as far as cheeses go, how many sorts of or varieties of cheese have you have you attempted? Um, I don't know. I think I have my ninety sixth or is it ninety seventh cheese in the press right now, and those are just the wheels of cheese. Um, most recently, the cheeses mm. that I made are. Cotswold, pepper jack, gruyere, black pepper, parm, romano, sal george, asiago, bel paese, cheddar, colby. That's the like the latest ones. Yeah. And then it goes on back through to like Gouda Divino and Budokas and Lancashire. A lot of them are yours. Oh, yeah. thanks. <laughs> now you have to upscale your recipes, don't you? Because you're yeah. using a lot, a lot of milk. Mm-hmm. So how do you go about that? You just do simple cal- simple calculation mm-hmm. like you would a recipe? Yeah. I'm I'm learning. I'm still things are still changing. I am learning that I need to dial back on the rennet a little bit. And the other thing that changes is depending on where the cows are in their lactation, and also depending on what I mean. It's green right now, so they're getting all kinds of yeah. Depending on when they have hay or grain or grass, it changes a lot. You can see yeah. a big difference. So like. For a recipe for eight gallons, you would think it would be two teaspoons of rennet. I'm generally doing a teaspoon and a half or maybe a little bit less because they tend to get rubbery. Um, But yeah, I just scale up my pot. I have a big pot and I fill it almost to the brim. So it's like seven and three quarters of of milk. Gallons? Yes. Right. So what's that in liters? Hang on. Hey, Siri. I don't know. (laughs) What's seven and a half gallons of milk into liters? 7.5 7.5 gallons is 28.39 liters. That's massive. That is a big cheese. Yeah. So how much do they, how big do they how much do they weigh when you're finished? What's the what's the not, range? Not as much as you would think. I would say anywhere between five and I've gotten up to almost eight pounds. I would think that you would get a higher yield, but I have not been getting as high of a yield. And that's one of my problems that I'm I'm puzzling through that. I just made a pepper jack two months ago and then made the exact same cheese this week. And the cheese made two months ago was two pounds bigger. Right. And I don't know why. So that was the pepper jack that you made. Yeah. Yes. And, th- and then I made one this week. And the one this week is smaller. Yeah. And I would think it would be bigger because it's green, because we have Emma's milk, but it's smaller. And I watched, I watched that last night. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Nice video too, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, yeah, so that's strange. You would think that the Jersey milk one would be Mm -hmm. more yield because of the higher Mm -hmm. fat content. But, okay, here, one more thing to add to the mystery. Maybe you can solve this. Maybe. Yeah, I did. I'm I'm developing a Parmesan, a black pepper Parmesan, and it's supposed to be heated to 124. I heated it to 120. And normally my Parmesans are, are, there's almost no curd. It's very small. It just compresses so much. Yeah, yeah. So today I added calcium chloride, even though it's not supposed to matter with raw milk and I have a much higher yield. So I don't know, I don't know what the, what's happening with the milk composition Mm -hmm. of raw milk. Like, do they have lower proteins? Does does calcium chloride affect raw milk at all? That's one of my questions that I haven't. Yeah, it will. So it'll add more soluble calcium into the milk regardless, right, whether it's been heat treated or not heat treated. Okay. Uh, And you don't heat treat your milk, do you? No. (laughs) No. So it's just straight out of the cow, Mm -hmm. chilled, and then you Mm -hmm. make cheese out of it. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, so what it does is adds more soluble calcium into the milk, and then that allows the the chymosin to create a better casein matrix. So, the what? The what to create what? Right, yes. Here's some words for you. So <laughs> the the white stuff in the milk is called casein. Okay, right. yeah. Starts with a C. C A. Mm-hmm. Oh, I okay. can't. Anyway, casein. Anyway, so what that does when the when the rennet ends on the chymosin, which is in the rennet, right, 
-hmm. it grabs onto those molecules and forms a matrix. That's why the curd sets, right? Okay. So yeah. the less calcium in the casein, the less of a firmer matrix you get. Okay. Mm -hmm. So therefore, so by adding in the calcium chloride, even though you're using raw milk, it actually mm -hmm. boosts that little bit of calcium. If the cows are calcium deficient, the milk's calcium deficient for whatever reason, it doesn't really mm -hmm. matter. Um, mm -hmm. Then yeah, you should always add in some a little bit of calcium chloride. It doesn't hurt, doesn't change the flavour yeah. whatsoever. You know, it's only a tiny amount that you add anyway. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you'll get a better yield regardless. Okay. Be I did an ex a test a couple months back with a Budokas that I made the same week, same cow like just a few days apart and one was calcium and one, one had calcium chloride and one didn't. And they were maybe like one ounce different, which was basically the same. Yeah. Um, so, but that was the same week. And I'm wondering if, because Daisy's so far along, like she's over a year old and still giving yeah. milk. I mean, a year in her lactation giving milk that I wonder if, it doesn't. I don't know. I haven't. Yeah, I haven't the proteins. It. Yeah, the the longer the lactation period, the the proteins start to drop off as well. There you go. And proteins are part of the casein matrix, so okay. you'll get a, a less yield, even though the fat content may be still higher. But it's it's really hard to check unless you get a machine that will test yeah. for the protein and the fat content, uh -huh. and they're quite expensive. So. Yeah, you don't, you don't need one. Just, just make it. Just I'll make just it. use calcium chloride. Okay, that's yeah, good yeah, to yeah. know. That explains a lot. There you wow. go. Thank you. Uh, no problem <laughs> at all. So what what made you uh, start recording cheese videos on your YouTube channel? I know you do lots of homesteading stuff as yeah. well. What, what inspired you to do that and the blog? Well, the blog, I got inspired. Uh, it was back when my kids were little. They were ages two to six, I guess. And I, I don't like being at home with, I've homeschooled my kids the whole way up. I do not enjoy being with little kids and yeah. it's exhausting. And so blogging was, was my way of trying to focus on what was going on around me and make art out of it and use it as, I do appreciate it. So trying to focus and, and elevate that in a way that made me enjoy it more. And so blogging for me is very therapeutic. Mm. It's it's a very fast form. It's a lot of photography and writing, and I, it's my way of keeping track of what's going on in, in our in our life and my thoughts. It's a public journal. Yeah. But YouTube, I don't know. I don't know if I would have gotten into it if I had known how hard it was. Um, <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah. It, <laughs> so, so I am still on a steep learning curve and I'm still undecided because so far YouTube hasn't been an outlet in the same way that blogging has. It has yeah. been work. And I think what will make it fun is once there's a community and there's a support and there's that whole, I love, I love, I love creating. I love teaching. I love performing. I love all those things. And if, and if, and what I would like to do is figure out a way to optimize what I'm already doing and share it, potentially make money, though that's way down the road. I don't think that's yeah. really going to happen. But um, that idea of of using what's already here, what we've already learned and sharing it is is fun to me. Mm. Jury's still out on that, how it's going to go. Yeah, look, people like to learn. Um, and it's, oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, people like to learn. So that's why, and, uh, you know, YouTube being the second largest search engine on the planet, you can reach a large audience, you know, as as we have here. Um, on, can I say in, one other thing about that to you? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that got me um, interested was partly your videos because, oh. and seeing how you manage, you're you're a natural teacher, and the way that you are so um, calm, which I'm not calm, but you're very calm and methodical and soft spoken, and you have a very positive demeanor that's inclusive and and makes people feel welcome and is is um, encouraging, really, really encouraging. And the first time I wrote to you and you responded and paid attention, that's you've been a role model. So thank you thank for that. You. Thank you, Jennifer. I've gone red now. It's all <laughs> red. Plus the heater was on. It was a bit warm. So, but yeah, thank you. I'm blushing. Uh, no, yeah, I suppose natural teacher. I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just comes natural. Well, I actually had to learn it when I was a bit of background for you. Probably didn't know. <laughs> I was in the Royal Australian Navy for 20 years. Um, and uh, I actually, the last seven years of that, I actually taught 
other sailors how to do their trade. So I've had a bit of practice. So I've taught people how to do things for a long time. So I like educating people. And uh, part of Little Green Workshops, which is the company that Kim and I run, um, the first, even before we set up an e-commerce store, we were teaching workshops every weekend. So we we learnt those skills through practice, practice, practice. Are and you if teaching that comes cheese with, making? Uh, cheese yeah, making? I taught cheese making, just some basic cheeses. Mm-hmm. But we took we taught soap making, candles, bath bombs, all that sort of you know hippie stuff, which is great. We love it. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, Kim's a great teacher as well, but she's shy in front of the camera. So go figure. I don't know, maybe. But, uh, yeah, thanks for the lovely words, mate. (laughs) So where do you make your cheese? Is it just in your kitchen? Right here in my kitchen, yeah. So you're in your kitchen now. That's I am right here. Oh, and you've got cheese. I have cheeses. I I brought them up from the basement because, Well, show us your cheeses. Show us. Um, Well, here, I'll show you. Can you reach them? I can reach them. Right. You tell me if I cut out or something. This is the pepper jack. I wanted to show you the difference. Right. You see, I don't know if you can see how one is so much. Hang on, let me just go so you're the main one. Hang on, (laughs) can I do this? There we go. There we go. Right. So can you see the difference? Yeah, one's bigger and one's, is it made with the same mold? It's the same mold, yeah. This one was just so much bigger and this one is so much thinner. Yeah. So that's just, I wanted to show you that. Um, oh, what else is there to see? I don't know. I have, I have, I'm going to unplug one ear. No, that's two ears. It doesn't work. <laughs> you might be um, able to hear me. I <laughs> can't hear anything. Um, a Gruyere, this is 93. Cheese number 93. Um, oh, I thought you were going to say 1993 then. No. That's no. an old cheese. <laughs> I have had, um, some of my, this is a Colby and some of them are, oozing and some of that oil around the edge. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't think, I thought that happened when it's warm outside or warm in the, and when you're um, air drying it, but it seems for some reason certain ones are oozing a little bit more. So I didn't know if I had too much, like if I didn't skim them enough, they, should, they had too much fat in, or if it was just too warm, I don't know. But um, Yeah, well, I just find that the pressure... Uh, that you know the pressure pulls some of the either the whey or some of the oil uh, or the fat out of the cheese occasionally doesn't happen very often as long as it's dry when you put it in the vac pack you know and and remember that when you do and and you've probably found this when you pull the cheese out of the vacuum pack when it's mature to eat there's hardly any of that stuff in in there anyway there's not much Mm -hmm. in there so you know it's it even though it looks like a lot in the plastic it's not yeah. And it was when it was drying, it got dry. And then I noticed it's had a little bit of oil forming on it. It'll be fine because I've had this happen to another one and it tasted fine. Mm. But it's just a difference. Things keep changing on me all the time. And it's, yeah, it, it fascinates me. It's a variation of the milk as well. You know, like it's, it's, yeah. it's a lot of the to do with the seasonality of the milk. So there's not much you can do about it. But yeah, just roll with the punches. And you know, yeah. one thing I noticed on the, the, I've watched a couple of your cheese making videos, which are fantastic, by the way. Mm-hmm. They, they, I know they're a different style than mine, but they're, uh, they're free flowing, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So they're really cool. Now, what, one thing I do love is that once you've cut the curd, you're using your arm. <laughs> to stir the cheese and because the pot's so big right Mm -hmm. but yeah look artisan cheesemakers for thousands of years have been using their arms to stir their cheese yeah but it's great to see you getting back to the roots of artisan (laughs) cheesemaking my husband's actually horrified by that he said you're gonna post this with your arm in it i'm like that's what i clean it well i wash it and then i spray it down with vinegar but that's what you see when people are working in the big pots. You you yeah. have to. And and that way, I like it because I can feel it better because I've had yeah. trouble before with certain spots, um, like sticking to the bottom and not catching it. And then it gets melty and hard. And so this way I can just rub across the bottom. I can feel it. And I don't know. I like it that way. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, because cheese making is a, a sensory thing. Yeah. Right, so mm-hmm. you can figure out when to stop stirring the curds by the feel of the curds as well. 
That's why I'm, I always like to do that squeeze test. Explain the squeeze test to me. I am still confused about it. <laughs> it's so simple. <laughs> right, so when you, when you get to the end of your stirring time, right, and you squeeze the curd, and if it stays intact in a in a uh, you know the shape of your hand, so it looks like a ball type thing, right? And it stays there without falling apart. That means it's cooked. But then, if you then press it with your thumb, and then it falls apart, it's ready to press. It's that simple. Okay, but then explain because when you're doing like high temperature cheeses like Parmesan and um, Asiago and those, you can squeeze them when they're lower temps and they will stay together, but you're supposed to keep going and going and going. They will, but they won't then fall apart when you press them with your thumb. They stay stuck together. And you want them to stay stuck together? Uh, well, no. When you So you squeeze it, stay stuck together. It's a little ball. And then you okay. press it with your thumb, right, the ball of curd, and then it should fall apart easily, uh -huh. right? And then it's ready to press. If it doesn't fall apart, it's not cooked enough. It's too sticky. It will mat together too much. Especially with those high temperature cheeses. So you're supposed to, it doesn't matter the temperature at which they are being cooked to, they are no. still supposed to. Mind you, to... the Parmesan's going to be so hot, how are you going to put your heart a hand in I know. it? I know. Yeah, so, yeah. but look, those hotter cheeses met, meld together really quick, really well anyway. It doesn't matter how long you, yeah. you know, the curds are so tiny. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so the grainy, as they call it, grana padana. Oh, shh, I've said that. Don't say that what? word. Grana Padano. Is that the one you got in trouble for? Yes, the cheese and Ooh. desist. Yeah. <laughs> I <watched that. laughs> it's, it's the Vol Voldemort of cheeses, the cheese that cannot be named. It was hilarious. <sighs> Tell me about it. It wasn't that hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I was I think, laughing. You probably. I think, I think my reaction to the whole thing was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the actual, it, yeah, it wasn't a nice feeling to get a letter like that. You handled it extremely professionally. Thank you. I, well, I try to. I, try I would have been so that. much snarkier, and I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have been nearly as. No, snarky. I thought. Look, I've seen so many YouTubers lose it, and mm -hmm. I thought it was tacky. If mm -hmm. you know when they do that sort of thing, mm -hmm. so I thought. Look, I'm a calm sort of guy anyway, so. Just take it in my stride and hopefully. And the great thing was, and this is something I didn't really know, was that the uh, the curd nerd community, um, especially a lot of people on Reddit too, it was posted on Reddit and that's why, why it went viral. Um, a lot of people wrote to the consortium and told them where to shove their grana padano basically <laughs> and said, don't you be picking on Gavin. He's just making cheese at home. That's why the apology came quite quickly afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I think the, the community helped. I, yeah. I just put it out there, community jumped in, got on their web page and, uh, yeah, flamed them basically. It was good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was so good. So, mate, what are some of your... What are some of your successes and then challenges? Have you had any like failures, but you've recovered from them type thing? Probably. Well, yes, I have. I haven't quite well, recovered. I haven't no, quite I wouldn't believe you're a cheesemaker. You right. what? I said, if you said no, I haven't had any failures, <laughs> then I would I'd be suspect, I tell you. Right. Yeah. No, as far as failures, my I have I have not had a contamination yet in terms of like getting those bubbles, which kind of surprised me. Oh, the light me. blown. Yeah. yeah. I haven't gotten that. That's that's quite amazing seeing you exclusively use raw milk. Now, do you mm -hmm. feel do you feed the, the cows silage or not? No, they get ah, hay. There you go. Why? What happens with silage? Silage, silage is the number one uh, creator of late blown cheese. Really? Yes. I know that there's a there's a bacteria in the silage that when the mm -hmm. cows consume it, it causes. Um, it's called oh oh I can't remember just a big Latin name anyway okay. yeah just look for the late blown hang on I'll look it up two seconds okay. I can find it on the YouTube's uh, late blown cheese uh, the thing is called late blown deflect def uh, oh, okay yeah butyric acid 
is the stuff that causes, and there's a bacteria that causes this stuff called butyric acid, and it creates hydrogen and CO2 and makes the it blow up. All right, and the main cause is silage, uh, the cows eating silage. So, uh, so is, now, that is that different from yeast contamination? Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So it's not a yeast, it's a bacteria. Um, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so, this, so it creates the big air bubbles. Now, if your cows are not eating silage, then that's absolutely fantastic. So you won't have any of those late-blown issues. Now, if you do at one stage start seeing that occurring mm -hmm. in the milk, then there's a couple of ways you can treat it. Um, so you can do um, uh, low-temperature, long-hole pasteurization, mm -hmm. which is what simple, and that'll kill it. So there's a video on the channel, and uh, you basically heat the milk to... Uh, 63 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Hang on. Okay. Siri will tell me. Siri, convert 63 Celsius to Fahrenheit. Siri's not working. Hey, Siri. <laughs> oh, she went to sleep. Right. Convert 63 Celsius to Fahrenheit. Only on live. Oh, all right. It's... It's not working, and nothing works today. Right, it is 63 Celsius to Fahrenheit. It's 145. Yeah. 145. Oh, I was too slow. Um, so, yeah, so you heat milk 145, and you leave it there for 30 minutes, and then you cool it down to either the temperature you're going to make the cheese at mm -hmm. or to 4 degrees Celsius. Okay. Uh, which is 39 Fahrenheit mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Right, so, um, and yeah, so that low temperature long hold, that'll kill any bad bacteria, including the, the, uh, the, the bacteria that causes butyric acid. Uh, and it leaves some of the enzymes intact in the milk because it's the lowest pasteurization temperature you can possibly have. Uh -huh. Okay. So, and that'll kill that. So if you ever okay. see that happening, that, then that's all good. Okay, that's good to know. All right, so on to challenges again. Never yeah, so challenges. Yeah. Um, my biggest challenge was, okay, I, I, I had been thinking a lot about, this was back when cheeses 30, 40, 50, those, the number of cheeses that I made. And I was around that time over the winter, I was thinking of trying to switch to more, trying to figure out how to make cheese making less with the freeze dried cultures and more with natural cultures and just, it's kind of like sourdough bread where you step away and just use whatever you have in your environment and see if that yeah. works. Um, yogurt works wonderfully. I've been using yogurt very well with like the Alpine Tome and yeah. um, all the high temp cheeses. I've, and that's been great. But kefir or kefir, depending on how you pronounce yeah, it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't like how that tastes on its own. I don't like how it smells. And then putting it in the cheeses, I could still... Like, even after slice, I could hear, I could feel just a little flavor of it, and I, I don't yeah. like it. And so I did a whole bunch of cheeses, and some of them were got quite funky. And so, yeah, not that anymore. Yeah, I'm not so a fan. I think you can do. You can, have you tried it? Have you tried it? I tried kefir, but not in cheese. So yeah, I'm not a fan of the drink personally. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, having read uh, David Asher's book, the mm -hmm. uh, the art of making cheese, or the Black Cheese Maker School, Black whatever school, called, sheep. Black sheep the school, Black Sheep Maker School, Black Sheep School, Black Sheep School, one. Uh, kefir, he mentions that kefir has quite a few different types of molds. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah. Nice looking bloke. Yeah. Um, so it has Streptococcus thermophilus. So it's got a thermophilic culture in it. I think it's got one of the two main strains of lactobacillus lactis cult strains. And it's also got geo in there as well. So geo, the yeast geo, mm -hmm. trichum candidum. Mm -hmm. So it's got, I know that's got those three, but it can also have some other funky things in there as well mm -hmm. that may change the flavor to something unusual that we don't normally like. Mm -hmm. But yeah, okay. I'm, uh, I'm not a fan of kefir grains. Yeah. Per se. So, it so I'll, I'll just stick to the commercial cultures that I buy. So, and yogurt. Like, I think the last uh, few cheeses, uh, like the uh, cacio ricotta, I made with some yogurt. I made, oh, something. Oh, the gorgonzola. I used yogurt as a okay. um, starter as well. So, yeah, that's got and a did, little bit. 
Oh, fantastic. Tasted beautiful. So the Gorgon's the Gorgon's I'll had uh, so had some yogurt, plus I think I put in some MA four thousand and one as well, which okay. has some mesophilic cultures mm-hmm. to help it out. So it'll produce lac, lac, uh, lactic acid at the start of the process and then as you heat it up it produces more. So yeah. That's yeah. why Gorgonzola is a little bit acidic, the blue cheese. So Yeah. I've been I've been also wanting to try with buttermilk, cultured buttermilk. And I have done one. I could taste the buttermilk in it a little bit, but I like the flavor of buttermilk. It's buttery. Mm. So that that didn't bother me. And I think I want to try doing that a little bit more for them the mesophilic cultures. Um we'll see. Yeah, so the the buttermilk is a is a lovely flavor. Yeah. I've used it a few times as well. So I just bought cultured buttermilk from the supermarket. Yeah. Um but really the the essence of it is an aromatic mesophilic like um Floridanica. Mm-hmm. So that that's what they use in cultured buttermilk. Yeah. Um and and they're still live which are good and you can reach reproduce them and it has a nice flavor. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. So so that's some of your um Challenges. What are some of what are, you, what are some of the best, absolutely best cheeses that have just run off the shelf? Well, okay. One is <laughs> one is a success, and that is a challenge because my cheeses change. One one of the this is one of the challenges that I've been working with is I feel like I need to make a cheese like ten times over mm-hmm. the course of six months, and they will each be so different. I have had Colby's that are almost, almost like spreadable. They're so soft. And I've had Colby's that are rubbery, bouncy, like a ball. And, and it's just, I keep, I I feel like as I work over and over and over again with them, I start to get the feel for it, but it's such a long process. And, Mm -hmm. and then there's the wait time, the aging time. So so that's a challenge. It's and it's something that I kind of have a mindset that I want to solve this problem. I want to figure out how this is done and know how it's done. And it just keeps changing on me. And I think that's supposed to be the fun of it. Yeah. But it's it's hard for I, I just need to let go and have fun with it. But I still keep trying to like solve the problem and I it eludes me every time. Yeah, there's um, a it depends on how serious you want to get with your cheese making or whether you want to take it the next step and go and do uh higher edu- advanced education on cheese making mm-hmm. you know yeah look I, I, i've done the, the same sort of thing i look, my cheeses are through experience uh-huh. I, I don't know everything i don't claim to know everything but yeah. what i do know i share mm-hmm. um so a lot a lot of people well not a lot of people some people are going that next step and but it takes a while um so I know uh, Wisconsin Cheese Board, I think it is, have a course that you can sign up online and do it online and it explains everything. Um, I think there are some video sessions and stuff as well. There's some here in Australia. There's a lady who teaches an artisan cheese making course in Adelaide. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that goes for quite a long time. That's through adult education. But there, look, everywhere throughout the world, there are, artisan cheesemakers that will help you understand the process better. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. you really got to go, if you want to learn more stuff like that, you'll have to go into the yeah. science of cheesemaking. So. And I, yeah, I don't think I want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> because. <laughs> it's just so much work and it's already, yeah. Look, it is. Look, it might take the fun out of it. That's why. I yeah, never, I know. Yeah. That's why yeah. I just, Stuck to home cheese making. I never, yeah. um, I never took that next step to becoming an artisan cheesemaker. Yeah. Uh, not to say, and, and not to say that being an artisan cheesemaker is bad. They have the passion that is just beyond home cheese making, you know, yeah. um, and they want to craft something that they can sell to the public, um, which yeah. is fantastic. And you know, I know quite a few artisan cheesemakers, and they have a passion. I tell you, it's just amazing. I- have you gone and visited them? Like, have you done your own? I have, I have been to a few dairy factories where they make mm-hmm. it and their vats, you know, like some of the vats range from a hundred, hundred liters, which is not a heck of a lot as far as artisan cheese mm-hmm. goes up to a thousand liter vats, mm-hmm. which, uh, you know, and they make multiple batches of cheeses a day. Um, I've talked to a lovely lady in the last, um, uh, in the last 12 hours of cheese last year, the last interview was a lady called Deborah Allard, and she runs a cheese factory out of their dairy um, in 
uh, northern New South Wales. And, uh, yeah, she gave us some fantastic insights. If you haven't seen that, it's on the it's on the podcast channel, Little Green Cheese podcast okay. channel, the full video interviews okay. there. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, I learned so much. Oh, that fun. I learned that I'm doing the things that I do right as well, <laughs> and I learned so much that if I wanted to scale it up some, then, yeah, so that would be good. That's yeah. a good review if you haven't seen it. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So so one of the cheeses that I had a really good success with was your Jarlsberg style cheese. Mm. It was beautiful. And I had the two, I did two of them. They were fantastic. And then my third one, it didn't get any eye development. Oh. And and it was it was kind of like a oh, I'm so bad at describing cheeses. I don't know, like a ah. mild cheddar or a cross, like a Monterey Jack cross or something like that. And it had its unique flavor. It was delicious. It was, I would like to know what I did so I could do that and make that cheese. Right. Um, but now, and so I made another Jarlsberg and it still, it looks like it's not doing the eye development again. Oh, and I, I don't know. I don't know why. Well, eye development with a uh, Jarlsberg is more about temperature control. So as long as you add the right amount of propionic Shimani mm -hmm. bacteria, mm -hmm. Um, and if that's the same throughout every recipe, you know, you're writing them down, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Good. <laughs> wait, I'm writing, wait, what you say? I'm writing down my what I do? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, I have a whole book. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Can't read my of handwriting, course. but I wrote of it course. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the recipes you follow are exactly the same. Now, uh, temperature is one thing that, you know, if you made one in summer, mm -hmm. right, and let it, and let it sit on the kitchen counter, the summer indoor temperature is going to be different than what the winter one is. Mm -hmm. So propionic shimani needs about 18 degrees Celsius or, 65. I don't know, I'm not going to convert again, whatever it is. It's like, it's like 55 and 65 and then back down. Yeah, so you yeah. for a week at, at 13 or 55 and then mm -hmm. take it up to 18 mm -hmm. or 20, around there, 18, 20 degrees Celsius. And then, yeah, that's when the eyes form. So if you can't get that temperature up to 18, then the eyes don't form properly and you don't get that nutty flavor. So, so you're saying if it's too cool, it wouldn't form. What if it's a little too warm? Then you'll get a runaway effect and you'll get too much eye development, too much I, CO2. Okay. I think mine's too warm and I'm not getting any. Oh, This is, what, this is where I'm so confused. Like all the things that I think like I would think what you were saying and yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's not doing what I thought would happen. So I, I don't know. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a really good cheese. We really like it, but it's it not, a, it's not Jarlsberg style. My, how, how old is the propionic bacteria that you're using? I mean, I probably bought it six months ago. It's in the freezer. Oh, that should be all right. Yeah. Yeah. Like when I started. Oh, did you, have you used the same, same bacteria for all the batches? Same mm -hmm. batch? Yeah, it's, it's a whole pack that comes from New England cheese making. It would have yeah, plenty yeah. in it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first few worked and then the last two haven't. So mm -hmm. maybe it could be the propionic bacteria, but it temperature, if that has ranged, like the the that two weeks that it sits at yeah. the warmer temperature, yeah. if that's different each time, then you may get a different result. I, that's yeah. I can think of. That's, that's what I'm guessing and... I do wonder, I almost feel like doing it again and increasing, like keeping the propionic shamani and see if that, like maybe just a touch more will make it go. Yeah, because you are using, making a big, big wheel of mm -hmm. cheese as well. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. in the initial recipe that I got for Jarlsberg from a guy in Norway, he gave a sneaky, gave it to me, not supposed to, but he did. Um, and then I scaled it down. The first time I made Jarlsberg, I used, what the scale down amount and i got the tiniest little eyes in it um, so then i doubled the amount of propionic bacteria and then the eyes were better okay so maybe throw a bit more of that in i'm, I'm gonna try that i'm gonna try yeah. that so look, it won't hurt to double it. it's all it does is create the co2 and the nutty flavor so, so it's not going to make it like blow up into a huge balloon well maybe but <laughs> we'll see <laughs> You'll see. But if that starts to happen, just put it back at 55 yeah. Fahrenheit, 13 yeah. Celsius, right? And then that stops okay. the CO2 development. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to try it. Yeah. Do it. Do it. It'll be good. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs>
So of, uh, of all the cheeses you've made, what's your favourite to eat? Not to that's not a fair. That's not a fair question. I know it's like my question when people ask me, "What's your favorite cheese?" It's all the cheeses. It's all of them. I just made a bel paese. It was. It's. I, I followed. Um, where is she? She's right here. I followed. Have you? Are you familiar with Luella Hill? No. Um, it's a. She's. It's this book. How's it showing up on the camera? There you go. Hang on. I'll make it. I'll make it bigger for you. There you go. There you go. There you go. Oh, <laughs> I can't see my... Yeah. Yeah, she's actually pretty local, I think, but I haven't met her yet. And I followed her cheese, and it has her recipe, which I think is very similar to yours. Um, and I've made several of them, but this one that's most recent, it's it's just wonderful. It's very it's very easy cheese. It's, I did a yogurt culture, and I I've, I've been brining my cheeses a lot longer than I used to in the beginning, between four and five pounds per pound of cheese, mm. and so it four gets five a good hours salty per pound. What? Four or five hours per pound or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Four yeah. or five hours in the brine. I've been doing it three to four and I'm, I'm starting to scale it up a little bit more. Mm. Um, I just, I like salt. <laughs> so yeah, so this I cheese, like cheeses on the saltiest. So yeah. It stops any bitterness during aging as well. Yes. Yes. And it just, it just makes them better. Salt's wonderful. Mm. So um, I did that one. That one turned out very good, very mild and gentle and just delicious. I loved the Jarlsberg, um I've had not quite as much success with cheddars. They yeah. have been, they just fluctuate with flavor and texture very wildly. They're not consistent at all. Colby is a, a, a given. And I know some people aren't attached to the yellow color with their cheese. And so I tried to make a Colby that didn't have any, any um, annatto in. And yeah. I needed my yellow coloring in my yeah. cheese. Yeah. <laughs> The cheeses I like to add it in, same as cheddar. I think cheddar needs yeah. to have a little bit of yellow color yeah. to it because mm -hmm. sometimes there's not a heck of a lot of beta carotene in in some cow's milk. Yeah, uh, and it depends on the grass they're eating, and mm -hmm. yeah, they turn out whiter than. And then when you give it to somebody else, they go, "Well, what's this? A white cheddar? Where's yeah. the yellow yeah. bit in it? I yes. won't eat it." You know, <laughs> I'm Colby. <laughs> yeah. So I like those. I, we've very much like the Cotswold. I make your Cotswold. Oh, it's and so good. When I added the garlic to it, it was so much nicer. Yes. Yes. Mm. I do. I only do it with the garlic. I follow yeah. your, your recipe yeah. for that one. Um, I just made, I have a, this is okay. You talked about failures and successes. This kind of, yeah. kind of goes hand in hand with successes. One of the things that I did is I tried to find local cheesemakers pretty early on in the process. And, we have formed a group of four cheesemakers and we get together every several months, nice. which has been super wonderful because to see everybody's style and to see the types that they do, the types of milk, their, their setup, it's so different. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but one of the, that one of the guys in the group, he made an Asiago and he, he um, took, he took uh, fresh rosemary and like, put it in hot olive oil and then rubbed it all over the outside of his cheese. And then he served it to us when we were there. It had, it had aged for a while. Yeah. And that was so, so good. Nice. So I'm, I have one that's wrapped over there. Um, yeah. I'm eager to see how that one turns out. Yeah. And the, one of the other successes has been, I'm only, I'm only into this. I think I started making cheeses last August. So I'm still a baby in terms of aging cheeses, but yeah. I have just opened a couple, um, a Gruyere and I forget, and I, was it Asiago? No, I forget what it was. I opened, oh no, Sal George. I'm yeah. probably not saying that right, but I opened uh, that. And the Sal Georgi, I think they say. Sal Georgi? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's just St. George in Portuguese. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. And it tasted, they're, they're so different. They're so different. The ones that are longer aged have yeah. so much, so much more to them. And yeah. it just, it was very affirming and made me realize, okay, we can, we can let these go and it's going to be okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. As, as I found with, uh, and Kim says to me, how do you keep cheese in the fridge for so long? How do you, how do you not bring it out? And I went, well, you just, I keep a little sneaky bit so you can't find it, and I put it at the back <laughs> of the cheese cave, and then I pull out these surprises. So, like, yeah. the other day when I was smoking, she said, have you got some cheese to smoke? That was her first question. I went, yes, I've got some hidden away, my love. And uh, and I pulled out this double Gloucester that was six and a half, seven years old. I couldn't believe it. 
And uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And the taste was well. You'll see at lunchtime if you're still around. So oh man, I've got a piece that I haven't smoked and a piece that I have smoked. So so were, was it how, like how much was it that you had saved? A quarter, so probably about oh, four hundred grams, roughly. Okay. So that's about okay. a pound. Okay. Yeah. So you cut it in half and smoked half in, and. Oh, I had, a, I had a half left, so I cut it in quarters and, yeah. Okay. okay. And you tasted it? Oh, before, not after. I haven't tasted the smoke ones yet. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, so the before, so good. It, it was left over from last year. So I yeah. did a taste test on it last year when it was six years old, and it was amazing then. And I said, I'll keep a bit for next year. And we'll, yeah. Lovely. So did it? Did it change? Did the, did the exterior change at all in the? Uh, it was, well, it was in vacuum packing and didn't yeah. really. It, it sometimes they tend to get a white powder on the outside, mm-hmm. which is just uh, calcium crystals. It's no big deal. Um, but the the inside of the cheese, um, inside the rind. <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. The um, the flavour, yeah, it was flaky and. Mm-hmm. There were some, um, uh, what is it called, Tyr- tyrosine crystals in it. Is the, that like the crunchy? The crunchy little... cr- yeah, yeah. Ooh. Those aged cheddar and hard cheeses get that in them. Uh-huh. Uh, and, yeah, oh, just the mouthfeel was just amazing. Deep, rich, uh, flavoursome cheese. So yeah. see if you can keep a piece in the cheesecake. For at least over a year, all right? Okay, okay. I will try that. The difference is astounding. So do you ever, what happens, have you ever had trouble from aging cheeses too long? Like? Yeah, um, mold ripen ones for sure. Okay, uh, well, I mean, I mean like ones that. cheeses? Yeah, no, no. The no. longer you age them, the better they taste. Okay. Well, that, no, well, that, that's, it's all subjective. So if you take a a kefili at three weeks, mm-hmm. uh, to me, it tastes perfect. Mm-hmm. If you age it longer, it's too strong and salty as far as I'm concerned. Oh, so that's okay. the kefili, right? You want a nice, uh-huh. It's a nice creamy texture in the middle. It's got a nice mm-hmm. thick rind that's all salty, beautiful. But if you age it too long, mm-hmm. it just don't like it. It goes hard and yuck. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the only cheese. So some of those young and same as maybe – uh, I've aged a tea, cheese. Uh, I was thinking of the Guido's cheese, that Italian hard cheese. I that haven't made it yet. Carol. You haven't made it yet? It's very nice. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, three weeks you can eat it. It's a hard Italian cheese. It's more of a table cheese, mm-hmm. a little bit light on the flavour. The salt's just right, but it's mm-hmm. mild, right, as far as mm-hmm. – a bit like a a young Colby but harder. Okay. With that, that was I, – I think I tasted that too early. Even though it said three weeks in the recipe, I think it was a little bit too immature mm-hmm. uh, for a cheese and it should have been aged longer. But as far as aging cheese is too long, I think Caffili is out there on its own. It's different mm-hmm. class because it's supposed to be served early. Um, but as far as like cheddar sole, semi-hard and hard cheeses, you can age them for as long as you want. Okay. Um, okay. This, however, the moist of the cheese, um, the the le- the less – how do I say this? So the moist – so cheeses like Havarti and, mm-hmm. and Budakeza, mm-hmm. I would not age those past the recommended aging time. They don't – because they're a high moisture content, mm-hmm. they don't tend to age well, and I don't think the flavour improves. It probably gets worse, if anything mm-hmm. else. But mm-hmm. the, the harder, drier cheeses, perfect, long mm-hmm. age. Uh, and go yeah. from there. So, great question, Jennifer. Yeah, yeah. it's like you're interviewing me. <laughs> I, I was debating how many questions can I get away with. <laughs> get away with a few. That's fine. <laughs> oh yeah. My goodness. So we've got twelve minutes left. So um, I noted. I remember that you sent me some photos about a month ago uh, where you had a cheese party. Mm-hmm. Does mm-hmm. this happen often? Uh, no, well, not, we've had parties, but we have, that was our only cheese party. Right. We do, do- we do donut parties where we make like hundreds of donuts and have over a whole bunch of Right. People. Donuts are nice. Yes. Yes. But they're yeah. not cheese. No. Not <laughs> no. So this, this cheese party, it, um, well, it happened. Okay. So 
First of all, you have to understand my aging setup. I have this little cheese cave that my daughter-in-law's father loaned to me. So it's just a wine fridge, a regular yeah. small under-the-counter one. So that was filling up with all my cheeses. And we were starting, we were at air conditioned. The downstairs bedroom, our house doesn't have air conditioning, but we air conditioned it, trying to keep the room cool. My cheeses were spilling over on all the surfaces and the cheese fridge was packed. And so my yeah. husband finally took one of our upright freezers and did the converting thing yeah. and turned it into a cheese fridge. So it stays right around 50, 55 degrees. And I call it my cheeser because it's a freezer turned cheese. Of course. Cheeser. Yes, you would, yes. Yeah. yes, of course. So that was then filling up. So it was getting, I mean, it was, it's unwieldy. There were so many cheeses and we can only eat so much cheese. And also my husband is lactose intolerant. Oh. So it's not, it's not like we eat a ton of cheese. So then I accidentally, um, well, without knowing it, I somehow subs uh, got a subscription to a wine a wine subscription and I didn't know it for 10 months. And how do you, when how I, do you get a wine subscription without knowing about it? I ordered a case of wine and apparently when I had done that, it had oh, yeah, me they up. Keep sending them to you. Yes. And they yeah. kept sending me notifications. Do you want to spend your money? And I kept thinking it was like them just trying to get me to buy one again. So I ignored them for 10 months until right. they finally got my attention. I realized what was happening. I shut down the account, said, please send the wine. And I had three cases of wine delivered. So then I had all this wine and I had all this cheese. Yep. And so we just sent out, I put out on Facebook to our community, said, anybody who wants to come over, here's the time. There's cheese to taste. There's wine. Bring your own wine glass and show up. And then we got all set up, got all these cheeses out. Like, it's a big deal to unpack a ton of yeah, cheeses yeah. and then to cut them up. And we were wrapping them and setting things out because people had the option to buy or donate, like, if they wanted yeah. to help support Daisy's food. So we set them out and we had, everything was out here. And then I started panicking that nobody is going to come. And we just unpacked <laughs> everything. There's no, oh. nothing's going to happen. And people came and they actually took almost all the cheeses. And that, I would say, Gavin, is maybe one of... One of it's it's not really a success, but it's what was maybe most affirming yeah. in this whole process is having people eat the cheese and value it. Because I feel a little weird, a little nerdy over here in the corner making my own raw milk cheeses, which might be scary to people or might they do taste different. They're not the same as in the store. And yeah. people might think they're not good. And but people came and they ate them and they really they really seem to like them. And well, like the bought them all. what? They bought them all. They bought them all. Yeah. And then and then the, the cheese fridge was the cheese the cheeser is now much emptier and now it's filling back up again. So I think we'll have to do it again. I still I still have a ton of wine. Like we only yeah. they did not they did not make a dent in oh, that. Oh you know, you offer free wine and free and, and free <laughs> cheese tasting. Of course people are gonna turn up. I know, I know. I would have turned I'm gonna, up. I, I'm gonna trust myself better next time. It was it was it was fun. Yeah, I bet it was, and I bet Daisy's well fed now for the next six months. Yes, she yeah. is. She's enormous. She's enormous. Uh, <laughs> well fed <laughs> and well loved. Yes. Uh, alrighty, so nearly time to wrap it up, Jennifer. Uh, what words of encouragement uh, or tips and tricks do you have up your sleeve that you would give new cheese makers that are starting out? And what's your favourite resource for cheese making or favourite resources? <laughs> Uh, okay. For cheese making. Um, favorite. Re I'll start with that. Favorite resources are your your website is phenomenal, and I often check there for everything first. And I will. Go, I like how you put the ingredients right in the beginning because I can go right to that and compare. And I'm often comparing different things. It's very useful. Um, use that online. I also have been following um, Venison for Dinner. It's a it's a blogger, a vid YouTuber in British Columbia, and she is has five kids, stays at home, and she just makes all her own raw milk cheeses yeah. on the farm. It's very, um, it's very different setup, and I get some ideas from her. As far as books, I used um, the home, this one has probably, whoops, there you go. Oh, yeah, edition four. Yeah. 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 This one has been very easy to read and is very helpful for me to, it's just, it's easy on the eyes and it helps me sort through. I often get confused mm. with so many options and I can just streamline it. Um, those are the resources that I find helpful. Yeah. As far as advice, um, you just have to do it. Like you, do. It's, yeah. it, you just have to jump in and go and, and know that you're going to mess up 
And I think I, I, I'm, I think a lot about how startup costs are expensive. And I had somebody had given me a cheese press and we have the land and we already had the cow. And those things have helped so much. But um, if you can tap into some resources and make use of them, just go for it and do it. Mm. And I often think about cheese making as is like learning a, a, a language. It, the best thing for you to do is to get into the culture, to immerse yourself in it, and you're not going to understand anything at yeah. all. But the more you're in it and the more you do it, the more you're going to start to understand and the better you'll get. And you might even become conversational in the topic and get to talk to Gavin. <laughs> it, it's funny. Um, one of the reasons that I started doing the live stuff, just normal weekly live streams, is because I wanted to talk to other people about cheese. Yeah. There's nobody in my town except that I know except uh, Charlie, who's in the chat probably somewhere, um, who lives just up the road, um, and he buys cheese making stuff from me. But um, – as far as home cheesemakers goes, not a heck of a lot of them around. And when you have a passion this strong, you want to talk to people. Yes, so yes. I it. And that's why I thought, well, hang on, this is pretty nerdy. So the, the old curd nerd stuff, <laughs> that's why, hello, g'day, curd mm -hmm. nerds. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's all happening. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, it's been lovely chatting to you, Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you oh, so thank much you. for turning up on um, 12 Hours of Cheese. Um, I might turn this into a podcast episode as well. It'd be lovely. We yeah. can cut and paste it afterwards. It's lovely. Okay. <laughs> so if you see your beautiful face again later, then you'll know what's going on. Okay. Thank you so much, Gavin. This is really fun. Yes. I appreciate it. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, um, yeah, thanks for the lovely words, mate. Okay. You take and care. congratulations on all of your wonderful, massive, big cheeses. And Thank say good day to Daisy. And is it Emma? What was it Emma? Emma. Emma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remembered. So say good day to Daisy for me, will you? Give me a kiss on the nose. <laughs> Maybe not that. <laughs> oh, they're, they're a bit slimy. They're very slimy. Yeah. Okay. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay. We'll take it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So I'm sure you'll agree that that was a lovely interview. Sorry about the audio on my side. Um, it was a little bit hot and I had to wind back the volume level of my voice only and then it went a little bit tinny. So not much I could do about it, unfortunately. Uh, it was recorded during a live stream. So unfortunately, I can't monitor the audio during a live stream. So hopefully you persevered with uh, the my voice anyway Jennifer's was lovely there was no problems at all with it anyway uh, it's great I wish I had my own dairy cows um, and uh, well done to Jennifer and her hubby who's uh, who milks them on a daily basis uh, and she gets so much fantastic milk so don't forget to go and check out Jennifer's YouTube channel called Jennifer Merch just go and search for her uh, and uh, while you're there, don't forget to check out some of the other uh, podcasts, either in the uh, the audio stream, uh, in your favourite podcatcher uh, on your mobile device, or uh, over at littlegreencheese.com, or at the Little Green Cheese podcast with Gavin Webber on YouTube, wherever you're listening or watching this podcast episode. Now, you could help out the show a big time if you leave a rating or a comment uh, leave a rating on Apple's iTunes if you're listening via audio or a comment and a like via YouTube well that's all we've got time for this week uh, over to Gav to do the outro well thanks for listening curd nerds you can find my cheese making video tutorials over on YouTube just search for either Gavin Webber or Cheeseman.tv. You can get cheese making kits, supplies and equipment over at littlegreenworkshops.com.au. Now, if you'd like a personalized message from me, I am available on Cameo to book. Just go to cameo.com slash cheesemantv, all one word. Stay tuned for the next exciting episode of the Little Green Cheese podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop and Call to the Dairy Cows. See you later, curd nerds. <laughs>